Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Spinner Reviews, and today I'm going to be talking about the new album from the 1975 called I Like It When You Sleep, for you're so beautiful yet so unaware of it. Somehow they managed to fit that on the CD spine. So changing tones heavily from my last full-length review where I was really disappointed by one of my favorite bands, let's move on to one that completely blew my expectations out of the water. I'm talking about the British pop rock group, the 1975. Now, I gotta be honest, as these guys were breaking through around 2013 to alternative radio off singles like Chocolate and Sex, I didn't really feel anything other than that they're just a not a run-of-the-mill indie pop band with nothing to make them stand out outside of comically thick accent. And with the over-the-top marketing leading up to this album in the form of social media blackouts and other cryptic image changes, plus the title of the album itself, I was coming to the conclusion that this was just another overrated, style-over-substance buzz band. But then I actually started listening to the singles from this thing, like Love Me and The Sound, and instantly noticed some massive changes for the better in their approach. So, I swallowed my pride, bought the album myself, and... Look, I never said I wasn't willing to admit when I'm wrong about something. I really can't remember I've so jarringly went from critic to fan on a musical act. Maybe Chiodos with Devil is the closest I can think of, but even that wasn't to this degree. Okay, so what's changed about the 1975? Well, first off, contrary to their name, a lot of the popular stuff on this record comes straight out of the 80s. And lucky for us, unlike most of this 80s revival bandwagon going on right now, these guys actually have the nerve to write songs strong enough to stack up with what they're influenced by. Like when that killer channel hopping guitar riff cuts in on Love Me, I hear some of the best traits of mid-80s Prince or NXS, all wrapped up in one infectious package, helped by uh, frontman Matty Healy, who is still very expressive on this album, but wisely made the decision to tone down that off-putting delivery he had before. That smooth tightness also shows up in the form of the weirdly titled Ugg, She's American, and even the more synth-pop leaning jams like Somebody Else. Or one of my favorites, Paris, where I'm getting a lot of very specific flashbacks to like Yaz's Only You, David Bowie's Ashes to Ashes, a bit of Every Breath You Take, and maybe a hint of One Direction Sight Changes. Not complaining, it's one of their better songs. But with enough little distinct quirks to make it work in its own right. And they even keep that quality as they get more spacious and dreamy on tracks like A Change of Heart and This Must Be My Dream, which I really admire since nowadays it's easy to just loop a three note synth progression, toss a drum machine under it, throw on some reverb and call it vintage. But much like, say, Bleachers or Born Cages have done recently, the 1975 actually want to do the sound justice. What a concept! Another great thing about their approach to 80s worship is that they don't just lean on 80s worship for their influences on this thing. See, much like its title, this album is very long and convoluted. It's 17 tracks, 73 minutes, and there's just enough variety to make really every moment feel justified in my opinion. Every once in a while they'll pull a new genre out of nowhere for a one-off and somehow not make it feel totally self-indulgent. Like If I Believe You with its subdued R&B styles keys that are giving me kind of a slow jam feel as he's talking about this religious existential crisis, contrasted with these epic choral vocals and even a jazz-like horn solo at the end. But some of the most musically ambitious moments on this thing are when they buck the pop framework entirely for these instrumental or semi-instrumental tracks toward the middle of this thing, like Please Be Naked, which has this very ambient film score-like quality to it, or the electronic title track, which builds perfectly from serene to invigorating over the course of its six and a half minute runtime. Sorry if my descriptions for these songs are a little short, but there's just such a quantity of stuff here that's hard to talk about everything. But also, I want to talk about maybe my favorite thing on I Like It When You Sleep, etc., the lyrics. You can even see the improvement in the song titles when you compare uh, evocative images like sex, girls, money, to the more nuanced themes seen here. It's always fun when it all clicks that what you're listening to has a cohesive story to tell, and that's what I see throughout most of these 17 tracks. Here's what how I see it. A guy, let's just assume it's Maddie, uh, gets famous in pop culture, he doesn't really know how to deal with the fame, but just kind of goes along with it, and finds himself in a relationship with a girl that represents basically everything wrong with the modern, shallow Hollywood scene. He realizes this after a while, gets disenfranchised, and goes through a bit of an existential quarter-life crisis about trying to find real connections. He leaves this girl, misses her a little, but is able to move on in the long run. Now, there are a lot of approaches you can take for this 
over the course of an album, including a number of pitfalls that a lot of indie music tends to fall into these days. Luckily, in my opinion, Maddie avoids every single one of them. For example, this album is very highly critical of mainstream culture, but here's the catch. He doesn't act like he's above it all. Look, I can sing the praises of Lord all day, but I feel like ever since she blew up and people tried replicating that, it's been the new cool thing to act all high and mighty against this boogeyman of the mainstream. Sort of like to indie pop what haters are to hip hop. It's this new form of hipsterism that's in a way a lot more obnoxious than your typical indie snob. But from the get-go, Maddie frames himself as just as suckered into the machine as anyone else. And even when he starts getting more critical of his situation and of the people around him, you can tell it's less from a place of I'm better than anyone who's ever taken a selfie, and more from a real personal need to get out of a culture he sees as very ego-feeding and toxic, which I can definitely buy into. Now, you could argue he gets a little snobbier on She's American, but I don't know, after a change of heart, I like that he gave a more light-hearted take on the same idea. Plus, as someone who's always lived in Southern California, like two counties under LA, these stereotypes exist for a reason. It helps that throughout this record, Maddie throws out some of the best turn of phrase bits of candid observational commentary out there. Sort of like a 2010's take on what Alex Turner was doing on Arctic Monkey's first album. Well, I should probably say now, if any of you guys haven't heard this album yet and want to come up with your own interpretation of things, you should probably finish this video uh, later on because I'm not saying it's a spoiler alert, but it's probably the closest thing to a spoiler alert that I can say in an album review. Anyway, going back to more atmospheric instrumental tracks, it's been fun interpreting their titles within the context of this album. Like you might look at the track list and see the name Please Be Naked and think, oh you cheeky bastards! But I see more of a double meaning as both a common idea in our sex craze culture, which is explored on this album, or more in line with the story, the point where he's looking to this person to stop taking pictures of their salads and posting them on the internet, to just be open and real with him for once, and coming to the realization that he's not gonna get that. Overanalyzing? Probably. But that's my job, damn it! Meanwhile, the ballad of me and my brain has some of the best imagery and storytelling here, including a hilarious part about meeting the parent of one of your fangirls. But the song that won me over the most here thematically among all this is Loving Someone. Now, as a songwriter myself, there are little lyrical strategies that I'm always a sucker for. One of those is when the chorus or refrain of a song stays the same, but in the context of each verse preceding it, the meaning changes entirely. Like, the line repeated, you should be loving someone, goes from society forcing the idea of true love to the very struggle for genuine connection that the narrator goes through on this album. And I thought that was really cool because, again, it keeps this album's perspective from being too one-sided. I also love that little spoken word diatribe at the end, all monotone and low in the mix, as if to say, yeah, I know 80% of you are gonna think this is a love song from the title, so I'm just gonna hide some of my most clever and subversive writing for the people that care. Another major revelation came when that staggering album title finally clicked with me. I like it when you sleep, for you are so beautiful yet so unaware of it. The way I see it, this instrumental takes place looking back on the previous events in hindsight with a new significant other, and being grateful that those thoughts of vanity never Across their mind. And even if I'm reaching a little bit, I kind of like this interpretation because it just makes things so satisfying and relieving. Also though, it's after that where the concept unravels a little. I see those last few songs as more like sketches that kind of relate to the rest if you make the effort, but are mostly self-contained. Like the actual love song, This Must Be My Dream, which I found pretty endearing, and the heartbreaking elegy, Nana. Guys, I've already gone on way too long about this album, so I'm just gonna end it here. Uh, as you can see, I'm absolutely floored with how the 1975 completely defied my expectations. I was fluctuating on whether to give this a 9 or a 9.5, but here's what did it for me. The fact that, again, this album is 17 songs, and every single one is worth coming back to. That's a feat I haven't seen in a pop or rock album since probably the last Paramore album. That kind of brilliant albumization is something most bands only dream of, and that's what makes it a 9.5 for me. If you're looking for some of the best pop music, best 80s revivalism, best musical narratives, and best cultural commentary out there in the style, I can't recommend this enough. So if you guys have heard this album, what do you think about it? Do you agree with what I had to say? Do you disagree? Have any feedback about the channel in general? Uh, Want to complain about my lack of conventional album reviews lately? Uh, let me know in the comments down below. Like my Twitter and Facebook pages in the description. Share this around with anyone who might be interested. And hope you'll see you in the next episode of Spinner Reviews. Bye.